Welcome to the Air Mobility Command Museum. This is the only museum in the United States that's dedicated to airlift and air refueling airplanes. Uh, we have some of the most rare of the large cargo and air refueling airplanes here. And a very unique feature of our museum is people can actually go inside most of our airplanes. We have every era represented from World War II up to the current airlift airplanes we use today. We cover the history of Dover Air Force Base here, everything from its uh, inception back in 1941, 10 days after Pearl Harbor, up to its current uh, airlift mission where we fly supplies all over the world. The original building that the museum is housed in is the rocket test center for the Army Air Corps during World War II. They developed air-to-air -air and air-to-ground rockets here at Dover and we were able to get some funding to preserve the building because it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places and, and it is an adaptive use. It makes a great airplane museum. This is the original air traffic control tower from Dover that was used from 1956 up till 2009. When they were going to tear it down, we asked to save the cab. Um, the contractor that was tearing down the tower actually gave it to us, put it on a crane, lowered it down, and we hauled it a mile and a half over to the museum and put it up on a short tower here. And now our visitors can climb up here and actually watch aircraft take off and land from Dover Air Force Base in a real aircraft control tower. Let's go downstairs and look at the C-47, the airplane we started this museum with and probably one of the most historically important airplanes we have. Now we're out in our main hangar area where we keep some of our most historically important airplanes. This airplane is a C-47. It was the first airplane to actually be a significant airlift airplane during the World War II era and this particular C-47 has the best combat history of any C-47 we've been able to locate. This particular C-47 took part in the paratroop drops on D-Day. It hauled British troops during the landings at Arnhem. It also towed gliders into combat and after World War II it was one of the very first airplanes used in the Berlin airlift. So it's got a really rich history and we salvaged it after it was being used as a target uh, and a lift load for helicopters. It came to us totally crushed and in terrible condition and our volunteers put it together to the point it looks like you could sit down and go fly it. Back in the day there was only one C-47 stationed here. It was used to haul parts around to different bases on the eastern United States. Um, the C-47 was a smaller airlift airplane. In World War II it was very significant, but by the time Dover actually became an airlift base in 1954, the C-47's era was pretty well finished. Let's go inside and we'll uh, show you some of the interesting points of the C-47. It's not very big by today's standards, but this was a leap forward when it came to aircraft in the early 1940s. This was able to carry 22 fully equipped paratroopers and they could jump out of it uh, into combat. It could also haul large amounts of equipment. There were specially designed bulldozers and tractors that were made to be put in a C-47 during World War II. Plus anything you could get through the back door you could tie down with a rope and fly. They hauled live animals, they hauled barrels of aviation gasoline, they hauled food. The C-47 uh, is one of the early great designs in aircraft and actually there are many C-47s or Douglas DC-3 aircraft still flying around the world today. The military retired them in the late 50s. There were a few that were used for special purposes later and actually C-47s were repurposed on the Vietnam War and made into gunships. Um, they weren't carrying cargo, they were just carrying uh, mini guns out the side windows and large amounts of ammunition and that's where the gunship uh, program actually got its foothold by using old C-47s and turning them into flying artillery posts. There was an airplane specifically designed to fly into rough country to replace the C-47. It was called the C-7 Caribou and it was a great airplane but the C-7 Caribous have all been retired now 
except maybe one or two somewhere. But C-47s and DC-3s are still hauling cargo in third world countries all around the world. This is outside on our main display ramp and the airplane behind me is a C-133. It's the largest turboprop airplane that was ever built in the United States. This is the largest airplane we have this month. By October of this year, we're gonna have a C-5 here. And the amazing thing is, when we brought this airplane behind us here to Dover, which today has a fire truck and a staff car and a bunch of other displays inside it, when we brought it here, we put the fuselage of this airplane inside a C-5. Uh, it was a huge cargo plane that was designed for one specific mission. It was to pick up strategic missiles and haul them around to different bases around the United States so the Soviet Union wouldn't be able to tell where our missiles were at any one time. This was to haul the large intercontinental ballistic missiles and the early missiles were very large. Uh, each airplane could haul one missile at a time and it filled the aircraft when you put them inside. It was like playing chess with nuclear missiles. The airplane was designed and built by Douglas Aircraft. We built 50 of them for use around the world. They were only stationed two places, here at Dover and out at Travis Air Force Base in California. Uh, the last C-133 retired in 1971. As soon as the C-5 came online and could do the same things in a better manner, they retired to C-133s. They only built 50 in the first place and there's probably four of them left in the world. One of the most difficult things we had when we restored the airplane was removing all the nicotine from the flight deck. Uh, flight crews then smoked from the minute the door closed until they landed and the door opened, and that might be 12 or 14 hours. So they lived on coffee and cigarettes, and the, the residue of the cigarettes is difficult to remove. Our other major mission is air refueling of other aircraft. The airplane behind us is one of the first really successful ways we had of refueling other aircraft. This is a KC-97. Uh, K actually stands for kerosene because they had to differentiate what this mission of this airplane was. C stands for cargo plane. K stood for kerosene as a, a tanker. And this airplane is very unusual because it has six engines. Four of the engines are propeller driven, uh, reciprocating engines, but it couldn't fly fast enough to refuel the jet bombers of that era, so they added two more jet engines outboard just to give it barely enough power so it can continue to fly and refuel like a B-47 bomber. So this was a transition era airplane. It had reciprocating engines and it had jet engines. Uh, it was quite a handful. Uh, the amazing thing about this is you could uh, transfer 400 gallons of fuel a minute from one airplane to another in flight while you're going over 300 miles an hour. The boom in the back is actually the mechanism they use for transferring the fuel. Uh, the boom operator would fly the boom down into position with those black instruments called rudder vaders and then the boom would extend another 20 feet and plug in to the airplane that it was refueling in a receptacle. The Navy uses a basket and a probe to do it. The Air Force uses uh, a hard fixture that plugs into the other airplane. Uh, and it's the 20 foot additional boom has a shock absorber type feature so that the two airplanes can move in and out and still stay hooked up and refuel. And the boom operator can actually guide the two airplanes with his rudder vaders to keep them in position. There's also a series of lights under the uh, tanker airplanes so that the receiving airplane gets a green, yellow, or red light to tell them whether they're too close, too far away, or they're just right. This has been done for many years very successfully. Uh, it sounds more dangerous than it actually is. It just takes really good pilots to do it. Let's go take a look inside and see what the flight crew of a KC-97 would see. This is the boom operator's position on the KC-97. They were called boomers. He would lay down on his stomach on a kind of a cot. His chin would be in a chin rest and he would actually fly the boom of this airplane into the receptacle of the receiving aircraft. He could control how fast the fuel was pumped, 
whether they had to break away for an emergency disconnect. Uh, he could talk to the other aircraft. The other aircraft would follow the lights on the bottom of this airplane. Uh, but the whole airplane purpose was to pump fuel from one to another, so this guy was in charge doing the refueling operation. The fuel tanks of this airplane are actually in the cargo compartment, so you can see the fuel tanks that were used to store fuel to be transferred to the receiving airplane, and they were in the individual tanks because you don't want a lot of fuel sloshing around when this airplane is taking off or banking or turning, so the individual tanks kept the fuel controlled but it would also allow you to carry thousands of gallons of fuel to refuel another airplane. This is the refueling panel for the KC-97. With this, the flight engineer could refuel the aircraft. It was like an early remote control, not anything like your television remote today. It's nice to look at things online and in a computer screen, but until you walk up to an airplane and walk inside of it, and realize it's bigger than your house, it's a little hard to get those kind of images out of a laptop computer. We want visitors to walk away with a sense of wonder. We get in airplanes and fly all over the world and we still don't exactly understand how it all works. It's a part of our history that deserves preserving and we're proud to do it here.